Well, hello, California. It is so good to see you all again today. I'm just going to plug myself in right here really quick. Now, how many of you have I met from the last time I was here? Raise your hand. Were you at Let Parents Decide? I see some hands did come out here. Now, I have a testimony for you that is probably going to make you feel just a little bit uncomfortable. Um, it's a special testimony that God has given me. It's not one that anyone would want to ask for, but it's an important one. And I know that he has given me this story and my life and experiences and how he saved me from that to help you and your kids and the kids that you're, and, and even the children that we love that are not our own, trying to save the lives of unborn children everywhere. Because the truth is that abortion is even bigger than you ever thought. There's, there's a root to it. There's a beginning. There's a way that it's, the foundation is, it has been laid just to make sure that abortion happens. And I'm gonna share that with you today. And this is a quote from the Washington Star News in May, on May 3rd, 1973. When the late Alan Guttmacher, former president of Planned Parenthood and signatory of the Humanist Manifesto II, was asked how the Supreme Court abortion decision of January 22nd, 1973 could be made absolutely secure once and for all. He responded with two words, sex education. Did you know that the second line item of the most money that Planned Parenthood spends a year is on sex education? Number one is surgical procedures. Want to guess what that is? Abortion. But number two, this business, in order to continue to flourish with their business model, needs a sales force. And as Alan Guttmacher said in 1973, the marketing tool to ensure and secure abortion is sex education. In 1996, I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. I was not a believer, but I did graduate wanting to change the world. And HIV was something that I was really concerned about. And I was watching people die, even relatives of my own that were dying from HIV, and I wanted to make a difference. And I decided to volunteer for a local gay organization that was receiving government funding to prevent the spread of HIV. I was welcomed into this organization, and I was immersed in gay culture. I was immersed in gay sexual practices. I was immersed in risk reduction education. And then they said, now you need to learn how to share this message with children. So they sent me across the street to Planned Parenthood. And the director of sex education of Greater Austin, well, she took me under her wing. And I'll share with you what she taught me. She said, Monica, we have girls as young as 10 coming into our clinic. They have sexually transmitted diseases. They have objects in their body that we have to remove. And they're coming in for abortions. And I said, okay, you've convinced me. What do I need to do? Teach me. How do I convince these girls to stay away from sexual activity? You know, obviously, they're, they're 10. This isn't something they're voluntarily doing. They're, they're obviously in a situation where they're being assaulted. She said, no, no, no. She goes, stop. She said, you would be judging them to tell them not to have sex. And I said, but they're only 10. And she said, Monica, what you need to understand is that this is their choice. We meet them where they're at, and we just teach them how to do it safer. And so, I'll be, I'll have to admit to you that I submitted to the authority in the room. She's the director of sex education of Greater Austin, Texas Planned Parenthood. They're receiving 
millions of dollars from the government to do this education in the community and serve women. Who am I to say that I knew better? She was the authority and I submitted under her worldview and her authority and I allowed her to teach me. And one of the first things she taught me is, Monica, when you walk into a room full of children, I want you to imagine that they've done anything and everything when it comes to sex and if they haven't, they will. And so it's your job as a sex educator to teach them about every sexual practice and how to reduce their risk using condoms, lubrication, coming to the clinic to get tested for the STDs that they're going to get, and get an abortion. And although she said that these children were sexually active, she also said this, but they're not gonna tell you that they're doing it. And they're gonna be very inhibited. So which one is it, guys? Are they inhibited or not? She said, the way you break down their inhibitions is you get them in the classroom and you do an icebreaker and you tell them to shout out all the slang terms for body parts and sexual practices. And you write them on the board or you have them write it on the board. And sure enough, those kids are nervous at first, but when they notice that the authority in the room is encouraging them to do it, they do it more, and even the shy ones start to say it. And what happens is that they are then bombarded with a collage of dehumanizing terms. And that's how they start to change through sex education, the attitudes, the values, the beliefs of our children. They break down their inhibitions, and they normalize childhood sex. I spent 10 years in this field I rose up the ladder, I was trained, and even was at the table with the CDC and the Office, Office of Population Affairs. I was the Title X training manager of Texas and New Mexico. And the last straw was when I was training Planned Parenthood in South Texas. It was several clinics about human trafficking. I knew that they never reported statutory rape, and so, I was really excited to teach them about human trafficking because I thought, now they're gonna understand that this, statu this is statutory rape, it's human trafficking, and they have to report it. They refused to listen. They dismissed everything that I said, and I said, I don't understand, why are you reacting this way? And a nurse raised her hand, she said, honey, if she's not with this man this month, she'll be with another one next month. It's what they want. Just like in 1996 when the, great, the director of sex education in Austin said the same thing, it's their choice, it's what they want. They have a very depraved view of our children. But where, where did that begin? So let me take you to 1948. When I was at the gay organization, and I, I finally, the Lord actually came into my life and I, and, I would, and I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior and that's what really started to change me. And when I started to see things differently through his eyes, I started realizing and questioning this education. And by the time I had that discussion about human trafficking with Planned Parenthood, that solidified it for me and I knew I had to leave, so I left. And I was sitting at home probably a year later and I was thinking, how was I deceived by this information? How was I deceived with this education? How was I deceived into supporting the sex education and abortion industry? And the first thing that God brought to my remembrance was something that I was taught at the gay organization, that Alfred Kinsey was their hero, that he was the author of sex education, that he was the one that normalized the LGBTQ community by saying that majority of the people lean more towards bisexuality and homosexuality than they do heterosexuality, and that that's actually what's normal. And I thought, who is this Alfred Kinsey? So I Googled him. And on YouTube, I found videos by a woman named Judith Reisman who had done extensive research in the zoo, Alfred Kinsey, and who he really is. And in 1948, Alfred Kinsey wrote and published his research called The Sexual Behavior of the Human Male. And in that book, 
He documents, literally documents, it's very obvious, the sexual torture of children for up to 24 hours a day. And he was timing, and he describes them as professional, professionally trained pedophiles with timers on how the children reacted and documented how they reacted. And they reacted with screams and trembling, and he called that an orgasm. This is in his book. You can read it for yourself. I don't recommend you buy his book, but it's available, and you can read it for yourself. And do you know that the culture and the medical community and even the psychological community accepted his research? And it influenced thousands of people, and we're seeing his influence today. Now, one of the people that he influenced was Hugh Hefner. Hugh Hefner was a virgin when he went to college. But when he went to college, he learned about Alfred Kinsey, bought his book, and read it. And he, was, he decided he wanted to champion Alfred Kinsey's research. And he literally said, I will be Kinsey's pamphleteer. So Hefner's life work became to not only legalize pornography, but distribute it on a massive scale. And in 1953, Hugh Hefner started publishing Playboy magazine. And through the use of pornography, funded also through Rockefellers, Alfred Kinsey was able to continue his research at the University of Indiana at the, at the Kinsey Research Institute. It still exists today. They actually have a lot of his research locked up where no one can see. Even the courts won't allow you to see it. And the reason I tell you about Alfred Kinsey is not only did he influence sex education, but he influenced our laws. And there's document to show, documents showing that because of his research, the penalty for rape of women and children were decreased. Because you see, Alfred Kinsey justified and said, obviously children are sexual from birth because look at how they're responding to sexual arousal. So children are sexual from birth. From, they can be sexually active from womb to tomb. That's probably what today you would call a minor attracted person. I guess you can say that Alfred Kinsey was the first minor attracted person who conducted research and justified his depraved behavior. The government started to also fund him and his work. And what we end up seeing is that Planned Parenthood and Playboy came together and created an organization called SECUS. And you know SICUS today. They're the Sexuality uh, Institute and Education Center of the United States. It sounds very official, but it's not. And today they've rebranded themselves, calling themselves SICUS, Sex Ed for Social Change. But when SICUS first started, it was founded with the help of the funding of, from Planned Parenthood by Mary Calderon the former medical director of Planned Parenthood. So here we're seeing Alfred Kinsey's depraved sexual beliefs being supported by the Rockefellers, being supported by Hugh Hefner, and collaborating with Planned Parenthood because, like Alan Guttmacher said, sex education is going to secure abortion for them. So they began to collaborate and created SICUS together. Then they created, and actually here in California, the former Planned Parenthood of Santa Cruz Education, they decided in order to really get this sex education out there, they really needed to make it even more legitimate. I mean, we needed some government funding here. We needed some recognition from the government. Why just get donations? Why not also get the taxpayer money to support sex education and abortion? And so they created the... ETR, 
a training center for sex education. And so Planned Parenthood Santa Cruz then, the staff, founded ETR. And ETR, you will see their pamphlets in many clinics, many medical clinics today, teaching you about health and STDs, all funded by the government. Then a former Planned Parenthood Center for Population Options, well, they decided that that, sound, that organization didn't sound quite right, you know, population options, so how about let's call it Advocates for Youth. So Planned Parenthood changed their name, the Planned Parenthood Center for Population Options decided to change their name to Advocates for Youth. And Advocates for Youth today has been receiving hundreds and thousands of funding from the CDC for decades. And they are the ones deciding what the sex education will be for our children. All of this founded by Planned Parenthood. So here we see the Kinsey Institute with Hugh Hefner, Planned Parenthood, creating CECAS, creating ETR. We have Rutgers Answers, um, you know, Rutgers University created Answer, uh, Sex Ed for Honesty. They created another organization called Amaze. Who here has heard of Amaze? Amaze are videos that you can see for free on YouTube and they're geared towards your children and they're cartoons that teach them about the transgender movement, masturbation, sex, birth control, abortion, watching pornography as normal and healthy. They're incredibly graphic. Again, all of it part of Kinsey and Planned Parenthood. And then we see the human rights campaign in Glesson all working and collaborating together with an or a coalition called the Future of Sex Education. And together with CECAS and Advocates for Youth and ANSWER, they created the National Sexuality Education Standards. And your laws here in California are based on those standards. They are based on the root of sex education, right from Kinsey to Planned Parenthood, and that sex education has one goal, and it's to drive your children to objectify themselves and one another, and then objectify and dehumanize the preborn child through abortion. Not only are they getting private funding, but now they have government support. And your elected officials in California, they're funding it. These are the deep-seated roots of sex education and Planned Parenthood. And you probably are left thinking, well, what can we do about that? How can we change that? And this answer is gonna sound a little bit simple to you, but I'll share it with you because I know that it's gonna be the most important thing that you're going to hear about the importance of family. You see, when I left the sex education industry, it impacted me too. I was groomed by those very same people. I also not only taught comprehensive sex education, but I lived it. I lived it in my own life and my life was very broken. And I found myself facing my own unplanned pregnancy. And my automatic response was to schedule an abortion immediately. And I reached out to a friend who I had gone to an abortion clinic with when she had her abortion in college. And I had called her and I said, I'm pregnant, but I'm getting an abortion. And she immediately said, oh no, you're not. This is great news. And I said, no, no, it's not great news. I'm, I'm gonna abort the you know, I'm gonna have an abortion, it's not great news. And she said, oh, don't worry about that. She goes, Let, our children are gonna grow up together. I said, no, I'm, I'm having an abortion. She said, I cannot wait to meet your child. Oh, if it's a little boy, if it's a little boy, I, I, oh goodness, I imagine the color of his skin or the texture of his hair. And I said, you're not hearing me, I've already got the appointment scheduled. Oh my goodness, what if it's a little girl, a little Moniquita? with your eyes and your strength. Oh, oh my gosh, she's gonna be unstoppable. 
And as she continued to imagine my child, I started asking myself, why, why am I aborting? Like, all of a sudden I started thinking that, oh, wait, this, this really is a baby, it's, it's not a pregnancy. And then I started thinking, well, if, if I have this baby, I'm not even married, my parents have already disowned me because I'm living with my boyfriend, if they find out I'm pregnant, man, they're gonna be really mad at me. Then all of a sudden, and even though I was not a Christian at the time, I know it was God, all of a sudden I realized, am I really gonna kill my baby just because my parents are gonna be mad at me? That didn't seem like, <laughs> like a good reason, did it? And I said, you're right. I'm gonna have this baby. She said, yeah, of course you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you, yeah. And I hung up the phone. Or I told, actually, I told her, like, I need to get off the phone. I didn't need to, you know, get re I didn't need to, you know, cancel this appointment. So I hung up the phone and I immediately called and, and canceled that appointment. And do you know that when, when I called to set this appointment, I didn't make it at Planned Parenthood. You know why? Because Planned Parenthood, I knew them. There was something in my heart that knew I shouldn't call them. Now, I still called an abortion provider, but I knew that they would celebrate my abortion and even say, hey, girl, no problem. You're going to be free and clear. It's going to be no big deal. Come on in. And I didn't want to hear that. But let me tell you what happened, and this is where I'm going to get to the solution of things. What happened is I immediately became a mama bear. I immediately celebrated the life of this child. I didn't know if it was a boy or girl. All of a sudden, I was a mom. I mean, I was a mom as soon as I conceived that baby, but now I knew it. And I loved being pregnant, and I loved when he was born. I, to be honest, I was actually kind of sad when he was born because I had to share him with everybody else. I'm like, <laughs> I love feeling him. It did, we're, we're like one, and I love that. And then I had to share him with everyone else, but it was awesome because then I got to see him and I did see the texture of his hair and I did see the color of his skin and, and he did get my eyes actually. And so I love that. And God used me becoming a mother and choosing life and he used my son to draw me to him, to accept him as my Lord and Savior. And then I began to see what was really happening in the community. Then I was seeing how the children were really being hurt. Then I was seeing how families were being destroyed. And I started questioning what we were doing. And I started realizing we were pushing abortion all the time. And I also realized one important thing that Planned Parenthood always said to me. Parents, listen to this. Parents are a barrier to service. That is a direct quote that they said to me at every training I trained them at. Keep parents out of the picture at all costs. So when I was out of that field and researching Kinsey, and I was blown away because I realized that Kinsey was a big part of all the, sex, of the sexual assault and the sexual depravity in my own life, it was as if Kinsey was still the predator today alive and well, and it sickened me. And the next thing God had me think about was parents are a barrier to service. And you know what he said to me? He said, that's because family is the answer. He began to show me the importance of family. And he took me to Genesis and he made me realize that Oh my goodness, just looking in chapter one, he established the very first government, the very first institution, male and female, he created them. The very first marriage and family, the children. And he started to open my eyes and made me realize that Satan's attack, the enemy, he was attacking the very thing that God loved, the very creation of God. And today, those national sexuality education standards, not only are they driving our children to abortion, but Satan is using them to destroy their very identity and purpose. 
The new sexuality education standards, which I believe that you need to be working with your legislators to repeal those, to not follow those, although I know that their, their goal is to federalize these. But they want children to start learning their beliefs, their philosophy from birth. And you see that in their curriculum, they start in preschool. And they even want to teach it to parents now. Why? Because the enemy, Satan, hates God's creation. And if he can't kill our children in the womb, he will kill them in their hearts and he will kill them in their minds by confusing them, fragmenting their minds and their hearts, making them question their very biology. And you know what part of the problem is? That we are ignorant and silent about it. What I'm finding is that parents don't want to talk to their kids about these things because they think they're supposed to be graphic with their kids and it's uncomfortable and they don't know what to say. But all the while that we're silent, Planned Parenthood and her brood of organizations that she's created around her, they're discipling our children. They're discipling our children in the very schools that we pay for. They're discipling our children on the internet. They've even discipled you. I've actually had some pregnancy centers say, you can't come and speak because, because you're telling us that children are not sexual from birth and we don't think that's true. We've even drank the Kool-Aid. I mean, we even believe some of those things. And how can we overcome it? Not only does it take a family to raise strong children, it takes a family of Christ, and it takes God's family. It takes every single one of you, and it's going to be a little messy. And I'll tell you what, when I first started going to church, the unwed mother with a child out of wedlock, I was messy. Worked in sex education still. And this is, I'm not sharing this to be a woe is me. I'm sharing this because I want you to think differently about what, how you're serving in your church and your community. No one wanted to disciple me because I wasn't coming in a cute package. I was a Mary Magdalene. I was the woman at the well. And nobody wanted to deal with the messy woman. But luckily, God sees us differently. And I leaned in on him. But how much more would it be in healing someone if you would start to see those people with God's eyes and help them get past the messiness and disciple them and strengthen your own family and help these women strengthen their families? And we have the answers right in the word of God. Now many people tell me, Monica, you, might, you have to have a secular message because not everyone is going to want to listen to you talk about God. And I'll tell you this, I knew the data. I didn't leave because of the data. I left because of Christ. I left because he changed my heart. I saw what sex education was doing in destroying children and families in these communities because he gave me eyes to see. And the only way we can transform lives and save the lives of preborn babies and save these families and strengthen families is through the truth of God. And don't let anyone tell you anything different. And I tell you what, I spent so many years being an unbeliever, there is no way in thinking of how broken the things that I've seen, the things I wish I could unsee, the things that I've done that I wish I could undo that haunt me still today. But I have a great God that rescued me from that. So how could I possibly ignore his word? And neither can you because he saved you too. I'm gonna leave you with one scripture in Jeremiah. Be, in Jeremiah 1, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. 
to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Don't be afraid. God is with you.